Alison, so uh, thanks for coming on. I mean, I suppose the case of of Anthony uh, Braniff, who who you wrote about in the Belfast Telegraph, really highlights the issues with how the British state handled uh, informers within the IRA that have that have been uncovered in the Canova report. I mean, this is a murder that they could have prevented, but allowed to happen in order to protect a, a security asset. Yeah, more than more than one asset. There's there's a load of issues that come up with the Anthony Braniff case. First of all, I think that there was myself and maybe another journalist, Sean and Graham, in the Irish Times, were the only two people who managed to even get a family to speak to is because the stigma that still surrounds this case is, uh, you know, it's unbelievable. Well, I mean, really, in terms of when you think about the people that were targeted, they were almost all people who were accused of being informers and therefore members of the IRA, some quite high ranking, some very low level, such as Anthony Braniff. Anthony Braniff was 22. His only arrest had been in connection with Riot and Ardoin. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Ardoin would be a very Republican sort of enclave on a, an interface in North Belfast. It had one of the highest losses of life during the Troubles. There was a lot of sectarian conflict went on there. Um, and for a young man like Anthony Braniff, it would have been very common to be, have been brought in to, um, and joined an organisation like the IRA. He had been arrested in connection with rioting. He was released, but in that area at that time, it was obvious that there was an informer. There was arms dumps being um, discovered. There was something like 20 people went to prison over a period of time. It was clear that it was there was heavily infiltrated with informers. So Anthony Braniff was taken in by what they called the IRA's internal security unit, sometimes called the Nutton Squad. These are the people who investigated if operations went wrong, if informers were believed to be within the ranks. And Freddie Scapatishi, the informer known as Steak Knife, was the head of that ISU at that time. He questioned Anthony Braniff and, and assessed that there was nothing really to see there and released him again. But a couple of weeks later, Anthony Braniff gets a tap on the shoulder. He's told that he has to go to a meeting in a house in West Belfast. He travels there alone in a taxi. He told his family there was nothing to be concerned about. But during that time, he the um, both military intelligence, so clearly Scapatishi's handlers, were told a decision has been made to murder Anthony Braniff. Um, and he is being held in a house in West Belfast. And then another other informants, including at least one special branch informer, also informed their handlers that he was to be murdered and that he was being held in a house in Divis. And they were quite specific in relation to the area where he was going to be held. That would be quite a small part of, of West Belfast. It would have been at that time quite a sprawling flats complex that existed there. I suppose if I was to try and describe it to you know people in the south, it would have been it would have been similar to the old Bally Mun. It was like that type of, you know, those big industrial flats. Yeah, that were built years ago. Um and he was brought to a house um, close to those flats on the roof of one of those tower blocks. The British Army had a lookout tower, which could see the entire West Belfast. It was full of quite high tech for the time surveillance equipment. So to say they didn't know where Anthony Braniff was being taken and there was IRA activity in this house would have been a nonsense. There was no attempt made to save him. And the following day at around 10 to 11, there was reports that shots were heard in the nearby Beachmount area and he was found killed. The Canova team have already briefed the Braniff family. They will get an individual written report, but they've already been briefed. And they were told they've been shot five times by two gunmen using two different weapons. And that happened in quite a lot of the cases that there was two gunmen had to shoot an informer. And the thinking behind that would be, well, if one turns, he's equally as complicit in the murder as the other one. So they have to remain loyal to each other because they both shot this person at the same time, almost like a firing squad. Yeah, and um, I think it said he, he had his eyes taped over. Was that a, a a sign sent to possible informers or? And yeah, well, I mean, there was a lot of reasons. The fact is that he came from a really high profile Republican family. You know, these are people who can trace their you know, Republicanism back generations. He was from a very large family. I think there was like 13 of them. Um, and some of his brothers had also been, um, would be well-known Republicans, as were other family members. The thinking, they believed that at the time there was a divide and conquer going on within the British propaganda machine. 1981 was the year of the IRA hunger strikes. And in terms of um, support, I suppose, for the Republican movement, we had Bobby Sands' funeral earlier on that year and 100,000 people turned out for that. You know, it, it, it those images still remain online and you can see them. It was a huge turnout for that funeral. 
And that was really the 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 very beginning, the very roots of that ballot box and Armalite strategy, because quite soon after that, we had, you know, the first Sinn Féin councillor elected, Alec Maskey. And then there was, you know, that electoral success, which basically is what we see today in the modern Sinn Féin, but its roots came, you know, from, from that time. And clearly, as well as fighting the IRA on a military footing, the British government and the state also decided they need to fight them on a propaganda footing. And the Brennan family and other senior Republicans I've spoke to widely believe that Scapatishi was used and other informers in this way because the people they were killing were from really high profile Republican families. They were Republicans themselves. And those funerals couldn't have been better propaganda for the British state. You know, some of those funerals, they took place very early in the morning that have been only like maybe a handful of people of close family members would have showed up. The stigma around it was terrible. Now, the Branoffs, because they come from Ardoin, which is a very close-knit community, they say, well, if that was their intention, it didn't work. You know, we have pictures of my brother's funeral. There was hundreds of people at it. Um, but you could see how the image of the IRA, not as, you know, the Bobby Sands, you know, martyrs of republicanism, but as these enforcers killing their own people, you can see how that would have been in propaganda terms very valuable in yeah. terms of the British state and, and um, coming at them at that time. I mean, that case, and obviously the IRA, didn't they ultimately accept that he wasn't an informer and apologise to the family uh, through whatever channels? But it goes, I suppose, to the to the the core of what the Canova report is. And for people who who don't know it, I think it was a seven year investigation into the into the uh, the use by the British state of informers within the IRA, in particular in this internal uh, disciplinary squad, and effectively. Um, what has come back is that um, we all they there there was an acceptance I think even before it began that the, the the British state knew that murders were going to occur but didn't intervene, but there was always this uh, uh, sort of statement that well they save more people than 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 they allow die really and that has been even that claim however morally dubious has been torn apart by this report. Uh, John Boucher, he headed up Canova, he is now the chief, the chief constable of PSNI. He debunked that straight away. He said that should have always raised alarm bells anyway. I mean, there, there's there's myth that surrounds Scapatishi and Steak Knife. Um, we were told he was the golden egg of British intelligence, that he had saved hundreds of lives, his information was invaluable. And John Boucher said that should have rang alarm bells straight away. Nobody, you know, no informer would have the capability of doing that. As internal security unit, he wouldn't have had advanced knowledge of IRA operations. He would have known about the ones that went wrong afterwards or people were arrested or if bombs failed to detonate, of all that sort of thing, because that was his job to investigate that. He wouldn't have had prior knowledge of that. And also we know that the South Armagh IRA, who were the most active around the 80s and 90s, that they were very suspicious of him and took very little to do with him and had said, you know, basically don't be sending him back down here again. Um, you know, I was told a, a story by by someone who said that he had been down in South Armagh and they had a, a family who would have they would have been using their house for quite a lot of and their land. I mean, Burnham, this is a rural area, but this family were appeared to be outwardly hostile towards the Republican movement and the IRA, when in fact they were actually helping them. I mean, it's, it reminded me of that sort of French resistance stuff because they were getting a hard time in their community because they were seen as being anti-Republican when in fact, you know, they were probably the... And so it was kept so quiet and very few people knew about them. And obviously, the, you know, Skepta, she was trying to glean this information it was down in South Armagh and he'd picked up a letter in their house and there was a name on it He'd give that to his handlers and they had raided the house of another family with the same name who probably seemed to be more likely to be the safe house the IRA were using. And that was when they they caught on, you know, the only person not in their inner circle who would never have revealed this information was Scapatishi. And that's one of the reasons why they were suspicious of him. Um, and he was never sent back down there. So when people say, oh, well, how could the IRA have been so infiltrated when in the 90s we had the Canary Wharf bombs and all those bombings in England? Well, he would have had no knowledge or notion of any of that. Um, he was internal security. But he definitely did cause massive damage to the IRA. The takeaway line, I mean, the big line, the headline from Canova is that more lives were lost than saved. And that's key. And we are talking about, he said, he may have saved lives, but they were in the low, in the high single figures or low double figures. And Canova was investigating 14 murders and 15 abductions. So clearly there was more people died as a result of his activities than were saved. And of course, like the, the kind of bizarre bit, I suppose, is that um, 
he's not named in the report. I mean, everybody <laughs> refers to to him by name, of course, in the media, but the there there is another bigger debate, I suppose, going on uh, by John Boucher that you know I ca- can't remember the name of the policy. Is it never confirm, never deny? Yeah. Um, um, so like. Although everybody accepts it's him, um, the state is still will not say definitively it is Scapatici. Yeah, he, he is he is named in the Canova report as Freddy Scapatici because he was prosecuted for having extreme pornography as part of the Canova investigation, and it goes through. and It's interesting because the juxtaposition of how the, the position that's on one page it has this is the profile of Freddy Scapatici, and this is you know what we found out. And on the other page, it has steak knife, but it doesn't connect the two, even though everyone knows they are. And John Boucher are clearly very frustrated at this. He said he understands, you know, the never confirmed, never denied policy if it's to save lives and protect lives at that time. But clearly, Freddie Scapatichi died last year. He died around Easter time last year, probably coming up to the anniversary of his death. He's no longer here. There's no longer any national security justification for not confirming who he was, um, and as well with some of the other informers who've since died. And I think, you know, that the PPS had said several other people also died during the course of this investigation who were who could have possibly been prosecuted. Freddie Scapatichi went on to live in witness protection. In 2003, I was a journalist working um, in West Belfast when he was outed as, as steak knife. And at the time, he did a very good job of trying to turn that around and claim that it was all the big bad media and the secure crats and um, you know, journalists are getting briefings and off MI5 and this is all nonsense and they just hate people from West Belfast and hate Republicans. And then um, when it became clear that he was who they were saying he was, and a lot of this happened because, among other things, he had went to speak to the Cook Report and only people of a certain vintage will remember who the Cook Report was. <laughs> the Cook Report was, I just was glued to it. I loved it, but it was a... It was a, 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 a ITN investigation program and it would have had, you know, Roger Cook going undercover and tackling all these organized crime gangs. And it was very gritty, very raw stuff. You know, if you watched it now, it probably really looks quite amusing. But then, you know, it was the height of, of investigative journalism. Um, he had went to speak to um, journalists from the Cook Report in about, I think it was about 95, 96 and the recordings of that were released into the public and you can clearly tell it's Freddie Skeptici's voice. And at that point, you could see that he clearly had an axe to grind with Martin McGuinness because he named him several times throughout those interviews. But he then went into witness protection where he remained living very comfortably until his death. I mean, who, like, it is, a, you know, a very unsympathetic character to say the least. Like, who who was Freddie Scapatici and and how did he end up in in those roles, both as yeah. a, as an IRA sort of enforcer and then as a as a British agent? He was a horrendously cruel human being. He was the son of an Italian um, immigrant who came to um, Belfast, I think, just after the the First World War. But there was an influx of Italian migration to Belfast because, remember, at the time this was a huge, big, you know, port. It was a big shipbuilding linen industry. You know, it was a thriving, um, a thriving place at that time. And after we had a lot of Italian um, immigrants moved here, and we're all very successful. You know, and opening their own businesses. His father owned an ice cream business. Um, his family, you know, were I suppose by today's standards considered quite middle class. He was a very talented footballer. We're told as a, a young man, he went to um, England and Nottingham Forest for trials. Um, come back again. I've told you he was a bit of a homebody. Didn't really like being away from from home. He married a girl called Sheila Cunningham, and we're told that that relationship was was very coercive, despite the fact. And violent, despite the fact she remained very loyal to him right until his death, she would continually she would have visited him in, in England even when he was in witness protection. Um, and the his activities in the IRA, if someone was ever perfectly suited to be in the IRA as internal security unit, it was him. He seemed to really enjoy the not just the physical torture, but the mental mind games that he played with people in terms of how they were treated. Um, in some cases, he would say to them you know, after, you know, maybe days, sometimes weeks of torture, sleep deprivation, you know, playing loud noises, loud music into the room so they couldn't sleep. They'd be stripped naked with, you know, uh, uh, um, something over their head, a hood over their head so they couldn't see their hands tied behind their back. Some of them showed signs of torture, not all. A lot of this was very physically and mental, you know, mental torture. He'd have told them they were going home. You know, we're just going to confess 
confess to what you've done. We're going to have a press conference and you can tell everybody, you know, this is what happened. And then, you know, you can go home. You'll probably not be able to stay in Belfast. You maybe have to go somewhere else, but you're, we're going to let you go. Um, and then they'll be taken and killed after that. And it, those recordings of their um, confessions in some cases were brought to their families and played to them to hear their, their loved one's last words, which is really horrendous if you think about that. It's um, And some of those tapes he even brought himself to let people listen to because he seemed to enjoy that and get a you know a kick a kick out of that. He seemed to, you know, someone was perfectly suited for that dual role that he was in. It was him. You know, he was very violent, he was very conniving. He clearly had an axe to grind with other members of the IRA and he liked working for British intelligence, but there was myths around what he was doing and who he was. There was a a report that he went to meet Margaret Thatcher and Checkers and that there was parties thrown for him by the British establishment. And, you know, this was a very, very skeptical I mean, I had seen him quite a lot and from West Belfast. You'd have seen him on the road. He had quite a sinister reputation. He was a very small man and, you know, small, stocky, quite un, sort of uncouth um, sort of person. The, the thought that, you know, he was a bricklayer by trade, that he was mixing, you know, with the, the you know, the eating educated British establishment and checkers seemed quite unlikely anyway. But, you know, John Boucher said this was the stuff of fable and fairy tale. None of this happened. Um, you know, there's a lot of myths around him which are completely false. You know, he was obviously a very useful agent to the British state. But, you know, he wasn't saving hundreds of lives. He wasn't some James Bond style character hanging out, you know, with the government um, and army bases. None of that happened. But uh, I mean, actually, one of the, the things that does sound all also equally fantastical, but does turn out to be true, is that, you know, even in that internal security unit of the IRA, he wasn't alone in being an informer. Mm. Like, incredibly, it, there does seem to have been at least one other or maybe more uh, who are also giving information to the to the. That, that entire unit was almost stood down because it was there was suspicion on all of them. There was a guy called Paddy Monaghan who is since deceased and he was almost certainly an informer as well. Um, in one of the earlier PPS reports that we got in relation to there being no prosecutions, it stated about one of the suspects being stopped at a checkpoint and he was covered in blood. Well, what happened was they had killed a, a guy that accused of being an informer that it threw him in the rubbish chute of one of the flats at Divis Flats. I mean, what a way to leave somebody's body. And as they were driving away, they were stopped at an RUC checkpoint and he was waved on. And Paddy Monaghan would dine out on this story for years, telling people that he told the, you know, the cops this mad story to get to be allowed to be going on. The fact is he was allowed to go on because he was an informer and, and that was part of that too. And he was part of that internal security unit. There was clearly others. There was one um, in the Anthony Branoff case who was someone who's also from North Belfast. I hope that we will be able to name him at some stage this week. Um, and he went on then to actually Canova States within his report that one of these people, when they left um, Ireland, went on to work for British intelligence as a lecturer. He lectures and their army base is talking about counter surveillance and how best to infiltrate armed organisations. So he got a job and an army pension out of it as well as being an informer. And one of the other, like, suppose, and this isn't, you know, the fable and fertile, this is true, is that um, Freddie Scapatichi also got a payout from the news of the world. He bugged his phone during the phone hacking scandal. So when he left um, Northern Ireland in 2003 and he fled his Belfast, West Belfast home, he went to England and they tracked him. They tracked him because he was in constant contact with his wife. As I said, Sheila Cunningham would phone him um, and she would go to a phone box and take the calls from her. And so they were bugging these calls and they worked out his location. They were about to do a big expose on him when he got a, what was effectively a super injunction. He went to the High Court and lied through his teeth, said that he wasn't an informer and his right to life was being threatened. And the judge granted this injunction, which remained in place till the day he died. It does. Um, I, re I remember it even for the yeah. Sunday world. We weren't able to publish all sorts of information on the basis of that, which yeah. I, I don't even know if it's lapsed now. I'm, I'm it, has, even, it has lapsed. Has it? So yeah, we were, yeah. yeah. So that is why you've seen the, the, the BBC footage of him coming out of the house and shouting yeah. at the reporters. No, none of that was allowed to be shown until he died and also he, he, where he lived he ended up living in Guildford in what was a, a very sort of middle class area of England a beautiful sort of leafy suburb he were told he drove a very nice car lived quite a little quietly called himself Michael we even told at one stage he had a girlfriend who he had met him through his dog walking club or some other nonsense you know and these people are living next door to this absolute psychopath you know and had no notion of who he was 
And there also are rumours. Was he actually dead? I mean, if you had to show me his body for I believe he's dead. I thought, well, this is very convenient right before the Canova report. But John Boucher, he is a man who I trust. He's a man of integrity. And he says in the report, we have checked. Yeah. We can't categorically tell you that Freddie Skepitish, he died. He didn't take his own life. There was none of this happened. He just died from an illness um, in a hospital, you know, a man of 77. John B- Belcher comes out well, I have to say, and he, he comes out as a person of integrity. But of course, all of that, the the actions of the British state and their interactions with the IRA, it's all called the dirty war. And like, it really was a dirty war as as you've described. Does it tell us any lessons um, for policing in general and obviously policing in a, in a conflict situation or with terror terrorist groups? Like what lessons can we draw? I know he's come up with 10 recommendations, but is is the use of, of informants is it something that that the state can manage better? Well, I think if Canova's main aim was to get prosecutions, well, then it failed because there weren't any. But if its main aim was to shine a light into that world, well, then it was incredibly successful. And it has given us information and documentation. And it has also helped those families get the truth about what happened to their loved ones. So in that case, it was a success. If you were judging purely on prosecutions, then no. But yeah, I mean, he managed to sort of keep the, the families on board too. Right? They still have faith in him. He is, you know, he's a decent man. I do believe he tried his best against a very difficult situation. Look, you know, we're, we report on crime now. Crime is happening right now. And we know there is what they call covert human intelligence sources within, still working within those organised crime gangs. You know, informants, you know, types, whatever you want to call them, exist in every police force in the world uses them. It's not, you know, nothing unique to this island. It's how you handle them. And the fact is that what has always struck me about any of these collusion cases I've covered, whether it be loyalist or Republican or anything else, is who made the decision, who lived and who died. So some got rescued and some didn't. So at what point did someone say, let's, you know, go in and try and rescue this guy? And one case ago, yeah, just let that go because it may compromise our agent. Who made that decision? Because that is something that is always, I thought, if you're, if your defence for running informants is that they're helping you save life and stop crime, well then how can then you justify that they were allowed to take life? Like we don't allow the, the state to execute prisoners, for example, murderers, yeah. you know, but it's just amazing that there are these guys who are making life and death decisions and, um, you know, are is there any oversight? Like there certainly doesn't wasn't in this case, was there? No, and, and uh, you know, the, the oversight, what he actually described is, I thought it was a great phrase, John Boucher said, that some of them thought they were practising the dark arts. They were working completely off the books. You know, they weren't making proper records in terms of what they were doing and the meetings that they were holding. You know, in one case, in one of the PPS documents, it states that the the, the source, as they call him, which is Freddie Scabatish, he says, look, this guy's going to be murdered. He's going to be taken to this house to be killed. If he tries to run off, because he he his job was to go and do the interrogation, break them, get the confession out of them, and then he often left, and someone else was came along, and in most cases, two people like a firing squad were made to kill them, so they both then you know were equally responsible for it. He would have usually get offside before the actual shooting took place, and he said if he tries to run, then there's a fair chance he will. They're just going to shoot him then and there, and I'll be there, and his um and his handlers say to him we'll, we'll try not let that happen and he went well what if it does he went they went well, well don't tell us yeah yeah and I mean I'd say that that yeah. was I'd say the, the the not keeping of records was far from an accident um, yeah. and like obviously um, this is an IRA internal uh, security squad you know what has been because I think John John Boucher did call for a, a, an apology from from the IRA or how how has it been received by Sinn Fein? Have they yeah. reacted to it? Obviously, you know those links are there, and that's just the way it was. Well, I think I mean he called for the British government and for what he called the Republican movement. It's more vague than that to, to apologise. The British government are sort of hiding at this point in time. They're just saying they're not ruining it out. But hiding it behind the time, the the fact that there's ongoing civil litigation in this case, I'm not buying that. There was civil litigation in Bloody Sunday, and David Cameron stood up in the Commons and apologised for that. Um, I'm not buying that as an excuse. Michelle O'Neill came out straight away within, say, maybe an hour and a half, and she made an apology, but it was quite a general apology. I don't believe it's Michelle O'Neill's responsibility, even given the fact that she was at primary school when all these events took place. But there are people who are within, if you want to call it the Republican movement or Sinn Féin, who were about at that time and people who are quite proud of their former 
um, IRA passed. And it would go a long way, I think, if they could get a specific apology to those families. And even if those apologies take place one by one in private. Now, the solicitor representing them has said, you know, well, we know John Boucher's recommended that, but none of the people I represent particularly want an apology. You know, they want justice. You know, they want truth. Um but I do think that as part of our healing, you know, apologies go a long way. The Branagh family got an apology in 2003 when the IRA admitted they should never have been um, never have been murdered and that the information that they had at that time was completely wrong and accurate and that he, he was an informer. In fact, he had absolutely no knowledge. He was so low level of a, you know, a person. He wouldn't even knew where any of these arms dumps were to give information on them. Um, and so they apologised to him. And I could see from speaking to a family that that had helped them. You know, it had helped heal them. His children were very young at this time. And it meant then that they, I think, were left to carry the stigma of it. And that apology helps. And with some of the other families as well, the Kearney family got an apology and that has helped them. Albeit, you know, it doesn't bring someone back. But it's, I think a lot of this is about vindication and recognition and rec- recognition that there was, you know, wrongdoing all over the place. You know, there was no clean hands and this, you know, there's no good guys and bad guys. You know, there is a blurred line of what was actually happening and who was who was running these people. And as Boucher, you know, said, the British state was responsible for running Scapetition, was responsible for allowing him to behave the way he did. But these killings were carried out by the IRA. So he actually referred to it as a joint enterprise. And, you know, we know what a joint enterprise murder conviction is, and we see those quite often in the courts. But to refer to something like this as a joint enterprise I thought it was quite extraordinary. Yeah, it, it is. It is extraordinary, and and it does show that the that the lines absolutely got got blurred. Like we, it's it's an interim report, is it, Alison? Yeah. Like, is there more to come? Just to to end up, is is like. These reports do seem to go on forever, in, in fairness. But Oh, God, I feel like I've been reporting on this most of my life at this point in time. But yeah, this was an interim report, but the, the there was some doubt over the PPS and people appealing decisions not to prosecute. That'll all have to be ironed out first. And then we think in May, well, that's the families have been told, they will get their individual tailored reports, which will be really detailed printed reports about what happened to their loved one. And then the full Canova report will be published. And he has promised in that... And, you know, this is a bit of a teaser for journalists like us. He's, he's promised the full story of Canova will be told in that full report. And that, I think, will be very interesting, you know, in terms of putting even a timeline on these events and who was involved. We all know now that a lot of what was said wasn't true and a lot of it was actually worse than what was originally said. But, you know, put this in a timeline, put it in context. And also, I've always thought that, you know, what Canova did in terms of the resource and the investigators involved, the amount of information that they were given, that that could be used as some future template for our legacy, um, our, our leg- how we investigate legacy and how we deal with legacy here. Because right now, you know, we have this legislation from the British government that nobody's particularly in favour of. We have, you know, inquests going on. Nobody knows whether some of them are going to be able to conclude. There's all sorts of bits and pieces and there's no one structure. And this could be maybe used or adapted or as a model of a possible template for how people, you know, do get what a lot of people want. They don't really want convictions now because time has passed for that. And you're convicting old men and they're not going to jail anyway because of our Sentencing Act. But they do want the truth. I think they do want justice and they do want apologies and redress. And people don't like talking about money and civil actions, but money in some of these cases is really important because as a journalist, I've been in some of these people's homes, not not even just the Canova families. I just mean families who have lost during our conflict. And the majority of people who were murdered were men. And the majority of women were, were at that stage people who were at home looking after their children and all of a sudden were left with no breadwinner. Um, and some of them were flung into extreme poverty as a result of losing their husband. I have spoke to people whose father was dead and who were pulled out of school at 15 or 16 to mind the younger brothers or sisters because their mother had to take two cleaning jobs to put food on the table and shoes on their feet. And the impact that that has had on the rest of that person's life, you know, they give up education, they give up any hopes and dreams they had to become a childminder to younger sisters so that, you know, who were all grieving so that the grieving mother could go out and try and keep, you know, keep them from extreme poverty. And they live like that. And I think, well, no redress in terms of compensation, I think, can be quite healing in that, in that respect, because also it shows that that person mattered. And it also shows that, you know, these parts of people financially suffer too. So while some people find it distasteful to speak about 
I don't particularly, I think, you know, talk about the civil actions. Yeah, I think it sort of crystallises for the victim sometimes that the wrong was done because, and they can feel it was done because money has been yeah. paid out and it kind of, not that it puts a value on suffering, but it puts a, it gives, it's recognised that the state is not just... It is redress. Yeah, it's yeah, some it, redress. It, yeah. Well, no doubt we'll be back in May and we may then have Freddie Scappatici named, but I, I'm, you can be sure we're never going to get the names of any handlers in it, are we, even then? No, and, and you know, the fact that none of them, you know, the test for prosecution wasn't reached in any of those cases is quite controversial. You know, the Canova team seem to think that they give really detailed files to the public prosecution service that in any other jurisdiction would have resulted in convictions. The PPS are defending them, saying, you know, we were under-resourced and it took time. I mean, they had them since 2019 and the decisions weren't made, some of them, till the end of last year, the start of this year. So, I mean, I'm not pretending that I'm a senior prosecutor, but I assume someone gives you a file, you spend two weeks, three weeks, a month, however long it takes reading it, and then you make a decision. Yeah. Um, the years that it takes for these things to be dealt with, I think, causes an awful lot of frustration. And you would think John Boucher would have a good idea what would be a, a possible prosecution, you, you would imagine. He's a, he, he is, his career, his background is as a detective. You know, he's one of the flying squad detectives. You know, he's, you know, a man who's used to prosecuting people. He clearly, you know, he seems to think that there was enough there for prosecutions. Clearly, this dragged on so long, Freddie Skeptic, he died before he could ever be prosecuted for anything other than having, I think it was 320 images of extreme pornography, including bestiality, which gives you an idea what kind of human being he was. And other people who also died while waiting on these things happening. But I mean, maybe prosecutions maybe wouldn't happen because of our legacy legislation anyway. But it, I think that the PPS and the, the delay in those decisions, that impacts on families too. And we have to remember that all these de delays and justice have an impact on people. Yes. Well, thanks very much, Alison. And no doubt we'll come back to it again when, when the next stage of the report comes in. Yes, I look forward to that. That'll be another hard week's work. <laughs> thanks, Alison. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.